Uh, yeah, my name's Anthony Clark from Bloxus Architects. Um, I thought I'd just talk about, I sort of split the, um, I guess the talk in two bits. One, the first half is kind of about, which is something that I kind of, I guess I always wanted to, to learn about when I was a student. So I kind of tailored the, the first half of the talk around students, I guess, thinking, um, I know when I was a student, I was very interested in what other people were doing in terms of their experience and their motivation and um, what they planned on doing when they finished uni. And I used to look at people like Glenn Merkett and Laplastia and people that I really admired to see um, what sort of work experience they'd gained and what they got from it and how it might start to influence the work that they had done later on. So I guess for me, I was, and whether you take, you know, I mean, everyone's going to have their own agenda, but for me, I guess I was um, relatively strategic from um, especially finishing university about the kind of experiences that I got work-wise. I was quite interested in making sure that I got um, small practice knowledge as well as big practice knowledge and firms that I liked for their designs and firms that I liked for management and firms that I kind of liked for you know, a number of different reasons. Um, so I sort of thought I'd talk about that, my experience, and, and whether that um, helps anybody, you know, I'm not sure. Um, and then I guess how I've then taken, or tried to take, and am taking still, um, all of that information and trying to generate my own small projects. Um, a lot of the projects that I worked on in bigger firms were obviously a lot bigger, and so the scale is you know, pretty um, obvious, I guess. Um, this is that's just a photo of my little studio. So I have a little studio which I started um, towards the end of 2009 in North Fitzroy. I used to be in a really shitty little warehouse at the back of a vet clinic with um, no ventilation for a few years, full of painters, which was shit. So then I moved into this little studio a couple of years ago, which is above a cafe in North Fitzroy. So it's um, it's uh, on a little corner and it's, um, you know, it's a great little environment. It's quite a small, small workspace and there's me. Um, that guy on the left is not an employer. He, he owns the cafe, so I share a studio with him. And I have one employee at the moment who's um, a fourth year student at Monash. Um, this, this is a photo that's kind of interesting to me. This is probably the most amazing place that I've been, which is um, in Iceland where I went, my wife and I, um, were living in Europe at the time and decided to make a quick trip to Iceland camping. So we just rented an old um, station wagon, got a tent and, and camped around Iceland for a few weeks. Um, and I don't know if anybody's been to Tasmania, if anyone's been to New Zealand, but Iceland is kind of like <laughs> an unbelievable pumped up version of those two places. Everything landscape wise is kind of on the side of the road, icebergs and glaciers and desert landscapes and moon landscapes. It's, it's an absolutely incredible place for such a small place. And this photo, looking back, I'm not sure it's a great decision, but this photo is kind of how Black Line 1X Architecture Studio came to be. So I'll tell you a story leading on into how that practice started, but um, this photo was how the name came about. So it was in the middle of nowhere. We, we got to this site in the middle of the night, so we actually had no idea where we'd pitch the tent or where we were, really. We, some guy in a, a pub had told us that if we drove for 45 kilometres inland, we'd get to this amazing campsite. So we just drove and we ended up in this clearing. And in the morning, woke up and, and took this photo. But So Black Line 1X Architecture Studio is really the idea that there's, there's the black line, which is the road, that is not necessarily heading anywhere and the X, which is the tent, is the designed element, I guess. So um, it doesn't really mean anything. It's not um, overly philosophical or anything like that, but it means something to me, this photo and this place. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about, as I said, my experience. So I grew up in Hobart in Tasmania. Um, you've probably heard, and, and some of you may be from Hobart as well, um, a lot of architects who are from Hobart talk about um, that place and how grounded they are from that place as architects and how they draw from the landscape of that place to create their projects, uh, which I, I totally agree with. I mean, I'm from, um, I didn't grow up on a property in Tasmania. I grew up in suburbia on the eastern shore of Tasmania. 
Um, but still, the way that I saw Tasmania was um, weekends, long weekends, holidays, we would either go to the west coast of Tasmania or the east coast of Tasmania, um, both with family and with um, friends, camping and things on weekends. So I spent a lot of time, I guess, getting used to that landscape, getting used to that place, which is obviously completely different to Melbourne. But as I said, for me, um, I like to think that over the last sort of 15 years that I've gathered a lot of experience of place and I don't really know whether I know how to use those experiences yet, but I hope that I'm kind of starting to understand how they might come um, to fruition through projects later on. Um, this is how I saw Tasmania. So my dad was, um, you know, loved motorbikes. So every weekend or a long weekend, we would ride around Tasmania on his motorbike with all of that shit strapped to the back, camping. Um, so I spent probably, uh, you know, from 10 till I was 15, most weekends on the back of a motorbike with my dad. Um, and so that gave me, I guess, another, another kind of closer reality to um, seeing and experiencing that place. And I've only ever done one project in Tessie, so I don't know whether that's all been useful yet. But um, my, And again, my, my own experience is I started um, working in an architecture firm at 15, so I only finished year 10. I didn't do year 11 and 12. Um, I, I knew quite early that I wanted to do architecture or be, um, or, um, be part of some artistic profession. Um, so I started work at 15 for a firm called Bush Park Shug and Moon in Hobart, which was four really old guys um, who did, I, the work they did, they do now is pretty bad, but the work they did back then, I guess, I think had quite a profound um, impact on what architects were doing down there in the sort of 70s, 80s, early 90s maybe, modernist sort of houses. Um, and one guy that I used to work with, his name was Jim Moon, and he was about 65 when I started there. You know, he used to wear his sort of beige suits, that's what he'd wear every day. Smoke pipes, people were drinking wine, and all the, all the, all the kind of offices were fit with um, wire mesh, and there was yellow tracing paper, and it was very romantic. And I, I think that's, I really liked that. I really liked the idea that people would talk about architecture and talk about their designs and work together to come up with solutions which you know you know is probably a little bit different now and the experience that you will get in an office depending on that office will be very different to that it's not sort of um, it probably doesn't have the romantic feel that it does now where people are pinning up you know sketch up images and things so this is just my experience which I really like so I, I kind of I try and emulate these little things in not necessarily my projects, but the way that the studio is, is, is evolving in terms of um, working with other people, working with other professions and trying to be... Another thing that Jim Moon also did was he was very, very well liked by his builders. He was a guy who kind of... He was an architect, but he wasn't an architect in the true sense of um, it was architect against builder. It was a guy who would do his best to deliver a really good project with somebody else who was really good at what they do and they would always just discuss things and work something out and sometimes he'd win and sometimes he'd lose but every conversation was better for the project and it wasn't about I know more than you and I think that's what I'm learning in small practices for me that kind of attitude is actually really important that you work with the other people on your team and the other other professionals who are doing your projects to deliver a great result. Um, so this, you know, I, when I was working the firm, I was 15, I was doing a lot of crappy ammonia printing in a car park with no natural ventilation and running errands and doing really crappy jobs for the first year or two. Um, but I was also um, studying drafting. So, so I got into architecture because I had done four years of drafting of a night from the age of uh, 15 till I was 19. Um, and I started architecture when I was 22, I think. Um, so I've left Tassie, I've, I'm now 21, maybe I'm 21, um, decided to leave Tassie and start my architecture schooling somewhere else. So I moved to Brisbane um, because I'd heard of some really good 
teachers at the time who were teaching there, Britt Anderson, um, one of them, um, who I really like. Um, this is some of her work. So this, this was a big part of the reason why I moved to Brisbane, because there was quite a strong um, link between architecture and landscape architecture. They shared they share a, um, a, a campus, a building. The libraries are shared between the two disciplines. So I was quite interested um, in that, I guess. Um, this is some more work. So while I, was, while I was studying there, Donovan Hill, who you may or may well not have heard of, were very big at the time. So they, they were quite young. They would graduated, I don't know, five years, so maybe in the sort of late 90s or something like that. A lot of their early projects were really high end. I don't really know how they got those really high end projects. I've heard stories that they put $200,000 of their own money in to finish a project, which then got really um, rave reviews and they kind of went on from there. Um, I think they've now been swallowed up by BVN. I think they were joint and now they've kind of just been swallowed up completely from, from what I hear. But they do amazing work. Again, very kind of internal, external, connected to landscape, connected to place, connected to Brisbane, um, Queensland. Again, not the same as Tasmania, but again, kind of is giving me, I guess, a different sense of... Um, another part of Australia, another potential client down the track. Um, this is a project in Tasmania done by one of my favourite architects, Richard Lepastria. I don't know if anybody knows him, but if you don't, he's an amazing guy who talks really well about architecture, in my opinion. Um, he's, um, I don't know, he's probably 70 or something now. He kind of does a masterclass with Glenn Merkett um, and Peter Stutchbury. You know, he does. He creates these beautiful drawings, these beautiful plans, these very kind of Japanese ideas of walking inside to walk outside to walk back inside. You know, bunkers. You're always aware of your landscape. You're always aware of where you are. There's always some sort of disconnection from where you might park your car or where you might drag your canoe up from the beach, and you know, all these kind of very romantic, nice ideas. And he doesn't do a lot of projects, but um, you know, he does them very well. And, you know, this is the romance, this is how he kind of designs or, or designed when he started, is the idea of finding a site or getting a site from a client and pitching a tent and camping there for a week and working out, you know, where is the best place to put a fireplace and where is the best place to drink your cup of tea in the morning and eat your dinner at night and then design a, a building or a house around those principles rather than, um, uh, you know, just going there for an hour and, and sort of... Um, coming up with a design from there. So, you know, I kind of, I guess coming from Tassie, moving to Brisbane, I, I kind of found this working for that early firm and then latching onto somebody like this quite, you know, quite interesting. Um, this is his own house. So it's, on, it's in pit water, so you have to get there by boat. He's got three sons, I think. Uh, they all, until the sons got older, they, you know, they all sleep in one room. They pull down their bedding every night. The outside toilet, outside bath, outside showers, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's kind of a little bit crazy, but, you know, he's kind of... Now they've got all these little pavilions around that house for his kids who are older and things now, but, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting way to live, whether you kind of would live like that or not, but it's kind of, you know, he's a, he's a very interesting kind of character. You know, beautiful details. So I think his father, a lot of his time was spent sort of boat building, so his, his kind of attention to detail is very high, um, you know, beautifully detailed, although very simple, you know, there's nothing sort of um, necessarily complicated about those details, but he just puts them together in a really, a really nice way. Um, so this is me, obviously, pre, pre no hair. Um, and this is, this is me moving from, at the end of finishing third year uni in um, Queensland at UQ, I decided to move to Perth and do my last two years in Perth just to get another completely different perspective on um, landscape and architecture and design and all that sort of stuff. Um, so my partner and I bought a van and spent about four or five months driving through the middle of Australia, um, camping and sleeping in the van in 40 degree heat, which was shit for a lot of it, but really, you know, great for a lot of it. Um, to see this, you know, I mean, a lot of you may have done this, but it's completely different. You're going from sort of Tassie and then you go to sort of Queensland, you know, beautiful, everything's kind of green and lush and amazing. And then you get 
kind of to this sort of stuff where you're looking at these sorts of precedents, you know, these sort of massive structures of complexity and it's not really about, I guess it's about kind of romantic um, things in other ways, but they're kind of, you know, they're a lot more industrial now. So that was kind of my take on Perth, although not necessarily my take at studying at university, but kind of, um, you know, that, that place completely different to what I was used to. Um, after I'd finished at UQ, which, uh, at uh, UWA, which I think was like 2003, four maybe, 2004, um, I then drove with my partner to Sydney. So my wife wanted to work in Sydney for a few years. She was, um, she is in documentary, so she was working on um, wilderness documentaries while we lived in Perth, and she got a job working um, on another documentary in Sydney before we left. So um, this was my real first opportunity post-university with that five years of knowledge after working in that sort of little Tassie firm to find a practice that I really admired in terms of the work they did. So this is FJMT, Francis Jones, Moore and Thorpe, a, a firm who are in Sydney, originally um, M Mitchell Jurgler Thorpe, so who did the Parliament House. Um, Richard Thorpe, then I guess that, that sort of firm became, it went from MGT into FJMT and he's, you know, he was the project architect for this project in his mid-20s, you know, unbelievable. And then um, became FJMT. Um, and I was really interested in these sorts of projects. You know, I was really, I guess at that time, and still am kind of very interested in complicated projects that look very simple in the end and how that might happen. So I was very interested in the kind of what I thought at the time was kind of basic, simplistic architecture. You know, it was all kind of about shapes and... Um, you know, not overly complicated in terms of details. I was horribly wrong when I started working there, but, um, you know, this is the project that I then worked on. I worked there for about 18 months. I spent five months doing door details for this project, which is like the worst job in the world. And I hated working there. Like it was the, it was a very um, stagnant office where um, models that they did for projects were done at the completion of projects. If you pulled out a drawing board or any model making material, you were almost kind of ushered out of the room because it was kind of, you know, not neat enough. So the office was in the MCA, Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, overlooking the Opera House, you know, beautiful site, the clients who, you know, all very wealthy. Uh, it was a good experience, but I think I was saying before is that, you know, it's good to get experiences in firms that you love and, and experience in firms that you don't like, in my opinion. And I think the work that these guys do is absolutely incredible. But for me, the process that they go through of getting to those projects, I didn't really enjoy. Um, so I left them in 2006 or something like that, 2006, um, after being there about 18 months and started working with a firm called Terawa. So Terawa have an office in Sydney, an office in Hobart and an office in Copenhagen now. Uh, amazing, I loved working there. They're, if Again, if you don't know them, you should look them up. But when they were, they did this project starting out on their own, $1.2 million project, and they were about 26 or 27, you know, super young, only been out of uni for a few years. So they're doing really, really good stuff um, and really cheap stuff. You know, I still love this project. Um, you know, the details and things for the amount of money that they built it for are incredible and it's actually a really small project. Um, and they were starting to do little houses, beautiful little houses, sort of starting to look at that Tasmanian landscape but in a kind of, um, you know, a new way for down there, I guess, going from that modernist 50s, 60s and how they were recreating that into the sort of 2000s, which I really liked. And, and they had a really good um, studio work ethic it was a very design oriented firm. Lots of models were made. Lots of chats happened. Um, it was all inclusive, you know, just one big office. Um, it was great. Um, I then decided the end of 2006, start of 2007, that my wife now and I had decided that we were going to um, go overseas for a few years, get some experience overseas. 
Um, and it was as simple as we just picked a place each. So we picked a country that we really wanted to go to and we um, tried to get a job there basically. So we, we, we'd gone from Sydney, I'd transferred down to Terawar in Tassie for six months to spend some time with family before we knew we were going to go away for a few years to go overseas. Um, and my main, the firm that I really wanted to work for was Today Oando, who I'm sure you all know. So I wrote Today Oando a letter a month for nearly 12 months. And he wrote me, well, someone in their office wrote me a letter back once a month for nearly 12 months, and I didn't get a job. So uh, I decided that I would try and find another firm to work for after that. And I got a job, well, I'll show you then. So anyway. I got a job with Shigeru Bar Architects, so you may know as well, maybe. Um, we moved to Japan. This was our house that we lived in for the first six months. Um, and then we moved into a little, um, more like a kind of um, traditional Japanese house after this. So we lived there for a year. Um, and I worked for Shigeru Bar Architects, which was you know, amazing. I mean, completely different experience again. Um, these are some little projects of his that I really liked, some projects that are not necessarily early projects, but projects that he still does sort of scattered around. You know, he still does very, very small projects as well as very big projects. Uh, different culture, different hierarchy. So, you know, he's, he's the man and um, you will finish a project and he'll drive to the airport and everybody else has to catch the bus and everybody else, you know, works till midnight and if he wants to go out for a drink with somebody you have to go out for a drink with him or his team that's kind of the hierarchy of that office so if you, for me it was all kind of fun because i knew it wasn't going to be forever but you know for people who have worked there 10 years i seriously don't know how they do it you got kids and like shit man what are you doing but you know it was great to see you know and amazing details you know this is all made out of like just fab prefabricated um steel bookshelves you know it's a little art studio that's, that's absolutely incredible. You know, little details like the kind of little um, shoe tread thing, you know, even on the tiny little projects, these are really well thought out. And, you know, so I, I kind of love this stuff. Um, this is his own house, part of his own house. He lives um, quite close to the office. This project's called Hanegi Forest. So I think it's like four or five apartments. A lot of his projects kind of don't last that long. They look really good for a while and they kind of fall apart quite fast. Who cares, because it's all for really wealthy people. That's their attitude. Um, and you may well know this project. This is, his, this is his holiday house. So this is the first paper tube house that was signed off by an engineer that now you see all of the other churches and stuff that he's doing. One, one thing I found amazing is if you work on and see one of his residential projects from start to finish as the project architect, you're also responsible to maintain that house for about a year or two years after it's finished, which you know, just does not happen here. So it's your job as the project architect to make sure that you go and clean this place so that if there's any potential clients that drive past it, it looks neat. You know, it's amazing. It just wouldn't happen here. Um, but it's an amazing place, you know. I mean, it's just one room, but it's, you know, it's incredible. Um, and I was just going to talk about, these are, these are some of the, um, I, was, I worked on about three or four different projects. Um, a few were competitions, a few were residential projects. This was one for a, um, a casino lobby. So um, you may have seen some of the, in Las Vegas, some of the projects he does now is all about sort of timber, um, you know, overlaying mesh, sort of um, like brick and baskets and things like that. I mean, amazing detail stuff. But, you know, this is, I just wanted to show you this. This is kind of the level of, in order to get to that final result in a built project, these are some of the, you know, this is the models that they make to make sure of how they might work. You know, so this is, these are the bases of columns, and these are quite big. You know, these are sort of this high, these columns. But it's about getting the balsa wood wet, bending it, gluing it, bending it, gluing it, you know, weeks and weeks worth of work to create these unbelievably intricate structures in model to then present to the client. You know, it's like seriously time consuming stuff. And so these are some projects that I, you know, I worked on, which was, you know, I mean, amazing, but it really gives you a different understanding of the level of detail that these firms go to. 
I mean, he, that, a lot of people were making office, making models in the office. And, you know, he liked the, the little couches that so ca they would make the couches and the couches were about this big. And then they'd make the cushions for the couches and they had to have crimped corners. And the little, the little basins would have little bits of blue things for the water and, you know, it's like, but he would say, you know, which I kind of agree with, that the first thing that the client really sees is the model. And if your models have that level of detail in it, your clients won't question that you understand what you're doing. They will think that you've thought of everything. So they won't bother, you know, interrogating you about things because they'll think that you understand it, which is a really interesting way to think about it. Even to the point of, you know, the boxes. The boxes the models go in are immaculate. There's no little bubbles in the tape in the boxes, it's just pristine. So these are the boxes. So Shigeru Ban jumps in his car, jumps in the, puts the boxes in the car and tells everyone else to catch the bus to the airport. And this is the workers, you know, so this is kind of that thing I was talking about with the, um, you know, the Tazi architect. And these are the, these are the builders in Japan. You know, these guys are, you walk around a building site in Japan and they've got little ashtrays and little nail bins and, you know, you can walk around there in bare feet. It's just, uh, it's incredible. Uh, and these are just, you know, some some uh, photos which I kind of took, which I look back now and kind of think that they're probably starting to influence my work a little bit more than maybe I thought that they were, which, you know, which is interesting. The idea of thresholds and the idea of timber work and the idea of narrow movement and all that sort of stuff. Um, Church of the Light, which is probably my favourite building. If anyone's been there, Today Our Ando Project. Today Our Ando Project, that's a little window for his dog that sits at the base of his desk. Uh, jump on, jump to the next thing. Um, my, so my, my place of um, that I wanted to go and live and work for a year was Japan, obviously, and my wife wanted to move to France for a year. So she, she was done with the TV, she was done with documentary stuff. She wanted to be try and be a complete French person for a year and work in a bakery. That was her, no, that's what she wanted to do. And she got a job in a bakery, Rose Bakery, which is... Um, it's actually an English bakery in Paris, but she loved it. You know, she didn't, she didn't really know much French before, and now and she knows she knows she knows how to she knows every vegetable, every fruit, every everything in French, which is great. You know, so so again, we we worked in France for nearly a year too. So, um, I had the Shigeru Ban job before I left Australia. I didn't have a job before I left Japan to move to France. I had interviews, which I didn't get anything. Um, and so we were pretty much ready to go home. We'd spent all our money. We had a couple of thousand dollars left and I didn't have a job. So we were talking about borrowing $5,000 from somebody, family, to stay. And then I got a call from Jean Nouvelle, architects, who I'd had an interview with but didn't get the job. And that at that time been short, been um, selected as a um, shortlisted I think there was five firms to do a, a big billion dollar competition in Stockholm, in Sweden. And it was a six month paid competition between Norman Foster, um, Bark Ingalls, um, Jean Nouvelle, and I think there was one or two others. Um, and they needed somebody who, could, who was a native English speaker to deal with Arup, the structural engineers in um, London. So I, I was pretty much straight out of uni and all of a sudden I was dealing with Arup on a billion dollar project, which you know, I, I just had no idea what I was doing. But of course I kind of said I knew what I was doing. So this is the project. So it was um, a massive project to relink two parts of Stockholm together, old part and new part, with this concrete bridge which was done um, you know, a long time before. Um, and it was traffic orientated. So they wanted to bowl it down and make it more pedestrian, you know, more now, more kind of public transport, more, um, less cars, more people. Um, and basically this is the site. So it was looking at the connections between the little blob in the middle and the sort of two, the two ends, basically. This is, this is the, the progress of that particular part of the project over time. So it had become this complete mess, this traffic mess where you know, it's just chaos. Like, you know, I don't even know what it is. But it's, 
bus interchanges and cars and you can't walk from one side of the street to the other and there's a bloody 24 hour nightclub in the middle called Debaser. <laughs> and you know there's these there's these three bridges, the, the main car bridge, and then you can see this there's two bridges over here. One is for um, well they're both for sort of trains basically. And Jean's idea was to um, get rid of the big bridge and turn it into a sort of Ponte Vecchio style bridge for people and leave the other two bridges, the two infrastructure train bridges, put new bridges over the top. One would be like a serious 24 hour games parlour, anything you want, and the other one would be a sports field. So we made a model, part of a team. I think there was at the start of the competition, um, there were six of us. And by the end, I don't know, there was like 20 of us or something, like Photoshop gurus, you know, everybody gets involved. And um, the, we were lucky enough that Jean, Jean spends six months of the year in Paris and six months of the year in Nice. He wears all black in Paris and all white in Nice, I shit you not, even shoes, so everything. And we were lucky enough that the first group, including me, who started on the project, went to Nice to work on the project because he doesn't come back to Paris to work in summer. So he flies everybody to him. So we, he put us up in a hotel and we just worked in his little house you know, while he drinks and swims and stuff like that and works kind of when he wants to. It's such a seriously weird lifestyle, but rock stars, I seriously rock stars. But you know, my, again, I was kind of just, it was all kind of, even though I wasn't sleeping and it was, really, really, really hard work, harder than working in Japan. It was kind of all just information because I knew I wasn't going to stay there forever. And to get that experience in a big firm and to get experience with someone like him one-to-one -one was you know, incredible. So if you can, can get that, you really should try. Um, and this was the end scheme. You know, so you're dealing with people who are seriously good at Photoshop, seriously good at everything they do. You know, access to big firms, you know, you understand from a little firm to how these massive monster firms work. It, they're, like, they're like machines, you know, everybody does their job. There's teams of 20 in one room, 20 and 20, and things are always live fed between everybody. Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator, CAD, they're all kind of working, feeding. You know, crazy. This, this was the Ponte Vecchio. This is the kind of bridge, you know, that the people walk on, glitzy glamour, you know. This is this is this twenty. This is, so this trains go underneath. This is the twenty-four hour. This is the new hub for um, for Stockholm. You know, this is where everybody everybody will hang out. And this is the sports field that goes over one of the other bridges. You know ha what happens when people play sports and stuff. You know, obviously it doesn't really work necessarily. But who cares? It's a design competition. They're getting paid a lot of money. Although I think they got paid like three hundred thousand dollars, and it was all gone in the first four weeks because everybody flew to Nice. And we'd made these big models, so we had these massive, big containers full of models. All the computers, everything, they all go to Nice. Like crazy. Um, and this is, you know, these are images of um, it in uh, winter time. And this is, this is everybody at the end. And it's funny, actually, the guy in the middle actually now works for Hassel in Melbourne. But, you know, these guys, I mean, it was, um, for the last week, it was 20 hours on, four hours off, 20 hours on, four hours off. So you would work 20 hours, you'd go home, have to sleep for a couple of hours, have something to eat, have a shower, go back in. And you could watch, I can remember watching the guy sitting opposite me just get sicker and start looking yellow, like looking sick. It's like, you can't, you can't keep it up, you know, I don't have people keep it up, but there's people there's people in there who have been there a long time and they jump from competition to competition. Anyway. So I'm going to jump from a billion dollar project down to now I'm, I've moved back to, um, we've been overseas for a few years, it's now mid, about mid-2009 and the plan was to come back, work in a firm for a year or so, get some money and then start up a practice. I couldn't get a job. So I came back mid-2009 and everybody's saying, oh, I don't know, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, we've lost lots of projects, we're not really sure, it's kind of a bit of a funny time, towards the end of the year maybe. So it was time where, 
like, I had to try and get a job at a supermarket. And I couldn't get a job at a supermarket because everyone's like, who's John Novell? Who's Shigeru Ban? So, you know, it's like, shit. So it was like massive plummet back to earth, you know. I didn't know what to do. So in the end, it was, it was uh, we'd been back a few months. I couldn't get a job. And luckily, um, somebody that I knew who I'd met just out and about who was doing some teaching at Melbourne Uni said, you should try and get um, a session or a teaching job at Melbourne Uni. So I started teaching two, two classes, two studios at Melbourne Uni. And then one of my friends from Tassie wanted to do a renovation to his house in Hobart. He had $80,000. So I'd gone from a billion dollars to an $80,000 renovation project, all within the space of a couple of months. But, you know, hey, it was time. So it was just time. I just went, well, I would start my own practice. Bugger it. I had one project. I quickly came up with that name from that photo. All right, business cards, yep, let's just start. I'll just start, see how it goes. Um, so 2009, this little tiny project. So a, a friend of mine who I've known for a long time wanted, had three kids now, wanted one extra bedroom, a bathroom, a deck, and like a new entry kind of thing. Tiny, that was really small. This was their old house. They're in Lena Valley, which is which is kind of just on the outskirts of Hobart, only a couple of k's. And they've got this front yard, basically, which is where the, st the, steep, the site was really steep. So this was the best place for the, And it could also recreate that new entry space. You know, I'd been overseas, so I'm sort of going, oh, we should look at this and this, and you know, like all these details, and, you know, which we can't afford really. But, but this is kind of where I was trying to start you know, I've forced, had to be forced to think about all of the travel I've done and all the places I've worked and how I now quickly try and put that into practice because obviously you don't want to start churning out projects that come, are coming from nothing. You know, you're trying to use all of that information that you've gathered from uni, from travel, from all that stuff and regurgitating it into some kind of project that resembles some kind of information that you've gathered. So you start doing these, you know, models, where do you start, you know, same sort of thing, this is where it's going to be. Start looking at res code, you know, all this stuff that I'm going, crap, I haven't really dealt with all this stuff for a long time. Height limits, you know, boundary setbacks, all that sort of stuff. Um, till we get to a point where the project can be small enough and start to do all of those things, um, where it's got a little, this is the plan, so a new entry. That's the carport on the right, which is the carport that you saw in the photo. So really, it's a very small wing looking at a new entry, some courtyards to sort of make the space feel a little bit bigger. You know, it's like 40 square metres or 30 square metres, so it's tiny. A bedroom, a new bathroom. And this, and this is it. So that's kind of looking into the little courtyard, straight into the bedroom. It's really, really small. But I guess it was starting to for me to look at how I can deal with um, it's probably more Japanese inspired, you know, how can I sort of look at just planes and sim simple gestures um, dealing with little bits of joinery, little bits of detail, little bits of transparency um, and all of that sort of stuff, I guess, where I can, where I can get, what I can get for $79,000 really. Um, you know, little viewpoints, little courtyards to get light in, little courts to make things feel a little bit bigger than they are, um, you know, bedroom. And these little moments for, for their three kids, you know, which they do actually sit on that seat and wait for their mum and dad to come home, mum and dad to come home from work. So it was kind of a little foray into a small little project that happened really quickly um, that I hope started to um, produce some of the interests and some of the travel that I'd started to do. Um, and then that was it again, you know, then all right, it's going to start a firm, one project, project finishes, no new projects. So back to the start again, really. And then um, a friend of mine who I worked for at FJ, FJMT, who also hated working there, he lived, it lives in Sandringham. His kids, he works in a firm, his kids go to a little kindergarten and he said, I know you've just started up your own firm a year or so ago, nine months ago. My kids go to this kindergarten and they've been given a $200,000 grant and they need a new room and they need some new space. And I'm working in a firm so I can't do it. It's great, a new project. So I live to fight another day, you know, studio-wise. Um, 
this was the original kindergarten. They wanted a new entry space. In order to get more funding from the government, they needed to get more internal space so they could get more kids, so they could get more money, essentially. Um, and this, this was the project. So this is a $200,000 project. This meant that I was down there every weekend painting because they couldn't afford to pay for anybody to paint the fence. And I needed to make sure this project is marketable to get more projects. You know, that, that is the kind of dilemma of starting a small practice is that you need to make sure that every project you do is marketable to get more work. And it was a really great project. I mean, it was you know tiny again, but it was kind of interesting to deal with entry and deal with how you create a human scale or, or kid scale kind of place. Um, very different landscape again from Tassie over in Melbourne. Um, but again, I think, you know, hopefully starting to look at some of the things that I've talked about earlier on. Um, this project was coming to an end. I'd heard, a friend of mine, I don't know whether anybody's heard of Breathe Architecture, Jeremy McLeod, you may well have now, he's just finished a project called The Commons, um, which has done really well. Um, anyway, I met him, he, he started this little thing called New Architects, Melbourne, where it's for young practices who were just starting out to present their work to bigger firms. And the idea was that bigger firms would then overflow their work to young practices. So I'm about you know, two, two years in, 18 months into a practice, something like that, two years maybe. Um, and I presented this project and the little project at Jeremy's. We got on really well and he said, look, I've got a client who I just can't, she's really lovely. I haven't done any sketches, I haven't done anything because I just can't, I just don't have the time. So can you meet her and um, talk about you know, the sort of spaces and the sort of projects you want. Places in Brunswick. Um, this is the site in Brunswick. Very industrial site. Semi-industrial, I guess. Lots of units and stuff being built. Polish family with lots of Polish neighbours. They'd been living in this tiny little house, two-bedroom house, with a married couple, two kids, a 10-year-old son with autism and her mum. The 10-year-old had been living in their bedroom in a single bed for his whole life. And the mum was in this tiny little shack thing out the back. And they'd, they'd lived there for like 20, 15 years. So they were ready for a renovation. Again, very tight budget. Um, so semi, semi-industrial warehouses, which are all gone now, which are turning into apartments. Um, this project's called the Profile House, which is the one that's on the on the door. Um, but this is the process in the office. You know, I, I think from working at Shigiru Barn and from working at Terawa, I, I do, every project is designed through model, still. I rarely do, or I don't do any design work on the computer at all. So I, fi I find it a really good way of um, going through a process with models where you can just build planes, you can scrap it within an hour, you can do another one, scrap it, so you can make 10 in a day, you know, it's easy. And at that point, you kind of start to understand the scale of things a little bit better. And um, I find, anyway, you know, light and things a lot better than I can with computer models. So, you know, I generated a lot of these before I got to the final, the final result, which is um, you know, Profile House, which a lot of people kind of think was generated primarily from the old factories and warehouses, which is actually not true. So the, the, the shape of this place was actually because it's a very tight site. There's five people living in the house. The son has autism and they needed to, to make sure that he had his own, felt like he had his own privacy when in actual fact he doesn't. So the little house has lots of little mini houses, I guess, with inside the big house. And the idea that he could be within his own little gabled space, but still be seen from other little gabled space was kind of how the form created rather than needing to be the warehouses. Um, so these are some of the final models that I did, you know, little section models before this project was built. So um, it's really only, it was a kitchen, bathroom, extra bedroom, lounge room, um, I said little um, play area and kind of segregated space for, for the sun. Um, it's built purely out of Vic Ash green timber. One, because it's really cheap. Two, because it's really durable. 
and the idea over time was that it, it just becomes part of a suburban fence, that this becomes part of the landscape of that area which is grey and kind of not trying to stand out in any way. Um, it's not trying to be a hero project, it's, although it sort of stands out, or it did stand out for a little while, but now it's, it's pretty much black, so people just sort of don't really even notice it, which is great, and, and you, know, you know, and they love it, and they get lots of feedback from it, uh, which is really good. So this this was my third, this was the third, the third project done by the office, finished in um, 2012, and at this time I guess things are starting to this project was published a little bit, so the projects and the phone calls were starting to come in a little bit easier. So three, three years into the practice, um, there's a little light at the end of the tunnel, I guess. Um, there's more photos of that little project. Um, on the back of that project, I'm just going to run through through these. Oh, boy, too much. Another little renovation project from actually funny Japanese, she's Japanese, so she actually Googled Japanese architect Melbourne and called me and got, I think got a bit of a surprise that I wasn't Japanese. But um, she liked the idea of working with someone who had spent time in Japan and understood really small spaces and how small spaces can feel like big spaces. Again, they, didn't, they don't have a lot of money, so the idea is that um, it feels light, it feels bright, it feels very spacious, but it needs to be done on a super slimline budget with really slimline materials. Again, they live in a really... I was lucky the first few projects were kind of in semi-industrial areas, which allows you to be a little bit more gruff with the materials and things that you use. Um, again, go through a, pro a process of making models um, and diagrams to sort of say... You now These are council-orientated diagrams to say the street is very kind of residential until it gets to the end of the street where it becomes quite commercial. So that allowed us to sort of pop up here and there and have mezzanines. Um, and th this is kind of the <coughs> southern view. So that, those top windows on the left are from the mezzanine where they, they quite, they are, she's a translator, he's a teacher, so they quite often work up there every night and still have relationships with the buildings on the other side and people who are walking up and down the street. Um, the existing weatherboard house, which originally finished um, where that slimline window is, which is finished out here. Um, the fireplace was there originally from a, a sort of a lean-to. So we kept the fireplace and tried to work about, think about how to patch um, new to old and the fireplace was a great way of doing that. Again, it's on a corner site. It's just black stained plywood. Again, very cheap, but very robust. Um, and that idea of the idea of Engawa, so which is one of those sort of first one of those Japanese photos I showed, you know, the transition from inside to outside and, and the idea that people can um, walk from space to space without walking through a space. They can walk on the outside of a space but still kind of the inside and not really interrupting anybody. Um, and obviously because she's Japanese, you know, the idea that they take their shoes off here and they sit here and have cups of tea and can still have an engagement with the laneway by opening up these doors, which they do all the time. And they just get random dogs and things coming in, which they, you know, they love. Um, some early photos, again, you know, the idea of super narrow stairs, as narrow as they can be, so that they don't, you know, they're not really um, taking up space is something that's sort of a big driver in uh, for, for a Japanese client is that idea that there's little sort of nooks and crannies and tucked and no space is wasted and why would you have metre wide stairs when you know you can sort of get up 600 metre wide stairs kind of quite easy. The builders hated it because every time they walked up there they'd, you know, they'd kind of walk up like this to make sure they wouldn't scrape their jumper on anything and then have to repaint it. Um, so a very simple project. Again, this is the fourth project that came that came into the office, which was finished in the um, end of 2013. Um, and it's really funny. She's she's kind of um, these people in the apartments at the top can look straight into their bathroom, and she just doesn't care. And I, she, I said, well, maybe we'll frost things and screens. She's like, no, I don't want any of that. So, and there's still none of that. So she's quite happy to be an exhibitionist. Uh, you know, it's quite rough. It's kind of like the first profile house. They're rough. You know, they're, they're kind of. Um, I don't know whether 
it's for me. I'm finding in my own practice that um, details are hard. Really good details are hard to do on really tight budgets. Like clever ideas aren't hard, but actually building really clever little details with a really tight budget is quite hard. So there's something that I haven't really managed to explore yet in in the first four projects that I've spoken about. Um, and hopefully that's starting to come about in, in projects that we're doing now. I'll just run through some direction of the projects that are in the office now. Uh, so the office has been going for about five years. This is a really small little project for a dentist. Um, he wanted a man cave. He wanted somewhere where he could fix his push bikes. So this thing is tiny, it's like a bedroom. But they don't have any room because they're in the middle park. So originally I said, let's go underground. He said, I don't want to go underground. Okay, we'll do this little tooth, you know, this little tooth that sits on top of your old kitchen. Yeah, great, let's do that. I'm going to winch my bikes up the end. Neighbours hated it. VCAT, everyone kicked up shit. So above ground gone, below ground, here we come. So now we're going below ground to do a little bike store, green roof. Um, this project's in planning now. And after the stuff that went on with the neighbours, I think it'll be fine. Now that we're going under and not above. So that's an exciting little one. I haven't done a green roof before and kind of um, it'll be good to get into some little details which should be good on that one. Um, project in Baldwin North which is being built now. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Again, small budget. Um, again, going through models, sort of living dining spaces. Very um, interested in gardening so they've got some beautiful Japanese maple trees and things so we're looking at retaining those. Um, I guess this, this is kind of probably a, a, quite a landscape orientated project which is really interesting. You know, it's kind of hard to get all of those landscape things that I've um, spent so much time kind of thinking about into these little projects and how you, you know, suburban Melbourne projects, how you actually start to draw that in, in small ways. Um, so this project's under construction now. Um, that's what it'll look like. So it'll be finished in about five months. It's a project which I really loved, which died, unfortunately, but it was a little um, renovation project on a corner site in Brunswick. First time I was going to use brick, I haven't really used brick before, but um, we were supposed to start site four weeks before the clients decided to sell and move. So we had a builder ready to go. The project had been going for 15 months and they decided that she wanted to sell and move to be closer to her sister, which is fine. And I thought, a bit of a bummer. So I thought I was on a bit of a roll with projects, but and that was kind of subtle, you know. That was kind of a less, I guess, kind of still had a street presence, but the idea was that it was kind of a, a subtle presence, I guess, and a stepped presence. The profile house and the black and gower house have kind of been quite in your face sort of projects, and this one was. So it's going to be a lot more stepped and a bit more gradual and a little bit more kind of open to the public, I guess. Um, a house project, which is the first house project that came into the office, which is for a house project in, um, in Shoreham, Mornington Peninsula, um, where the idea was that they, it's actually a really difficult project because they were city slicker kind of people who had bought land in Shoreham and had moved down there full time and had a very city slicker mentality but wanted a beach house. So what we worked out really quickly is you can't, it was very hard to match the two. So they wanted all of, you know, we've got two four-wheel drives and a boat, we want it all under cover, we've got table tennis, we've got things, we've got pianos, we want all that in there. But we still want a beach house. So, so it wasn't really working. So it became quite big, it became big early. It's gone through other st processes since this, but I thought I'd put this one in because it was a really, the first bigger project I've had in the office in order to start using those same um, principles of gestures and those principles of yeah, um, not making things kind of complicated but not look overly complicated. It was two roofs with a, you know, a hole carved out of it and it had two wings and the central wing was kind of um, outdoor where you'd wash and shower and pack your surfboards and you know so it had you know it had kind of the city on one side and the beach on the other side with this kind of take off your suit and put on your wetsuit in the middle I guess um, and that was that was an image of that one 
quickly, I've nearly finished. This, this is what's happening in the office now. This is, this is a project which has been an absolute nightmare. So this project has been on site for two years and it's still not finished. The builder and the client hate each other's guts with a passion and no one can get out of there fast enough. But it's looking really good. So it's called the split view house. It's a very simple, you know, again, simple gesture, simple notion of the idea that one is a vertical and one is a horizontal. The vertical is the morning. The vertical is where you wake up and you, you're on a warm concrete slab and you have your breakfast and you sit in this morning sun looking out at the Merry Creek. And the timber is the, is the lower, more subdued horizontal where you end your day. Um, you know, it's basic stuff, but, but it's kind of, it's becoming detailed well, but, you know, dealing with small practice people problems, I'm finding really hard. Um, you know, some of these details are great. The light's great. Um, you know, these sorts of details, which is a genius detail thought up by a client where, how do you join timber to concrete where they rarely ever join really well? because the concrete is always chipped and the levels are always slightly different. So we, we cut a 10 millimeter groove between the two and banged in with a rubber mallet, a um, piece of copper pipe, and it looks so sweet. I wouldn't have ever thought of it. The client actually said, let's try this, brilliant. But it's not finished, so it should be finished. Hopefully by the, hopefully in the next few months. It's not painted or anything yet, but. Um, and this, this is the last project. So this is a project which I'm actually really excited about. This one, was the contract was signed by the builder. It starts construction next Monday. It's a really, it's again, it's a small renovation in Brunswick for a couple who don't have kids. They've got an amazing garden and they really wanted to do something a bit different with detail. So we're doing, you know, charred timber, burnt timber and, um, you know, curved facade stuff that I haven't done before, but you know, it's tight. The actual renovation is only 60 square meters, so it's really small. Um, you know, these kind of views of the garden um, and this final image. So a lot of the clients that I seem to get are quite obscure clients. This guy's got a really bad sleep problem, so he doesn't get up before three o'clock in the afternoon. He doesn't go to bed before about three or four in the morning. So all his emails come in the middle of the night, bang, 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 like 10 at once and he's out of action for the day. So he wanted this kind of end node to the building which could be complete lockdown. Black, thick, no noise, nothing. But still wanted it to be part of the house. So it's part of the curve and you don't actually read it um, you know, when you're inside the project, um, but you know, it's still part of the project. So it's not kind of left out, I guess. Um, and it starts, it starts in such a week. So it's, one, it's the first one where managed to keep the scale of it so small that we can start putting in some details um, which I'm really excited about and that that is it so thank you for your time